for those of you that were here last night, hopefully I can change it enough to where you can actually get something out of it. Um, I think last night, uh, for me, it seemed a little, I, I don't know that dark is the word, but it seemed a little uh, <laughs> not, not happy. Um, so we'll, we'll try to make slight adjustments, although sometimes, sometimes the word isn't easy, right? Um, and sometimes being a follower, being a disciple is not easy. And Jesus promises that to us, that it's not going to be easy. Uh, but before I dig in too much into the scripture, I want to talk a little bit about the background of the Red Letters. And this is a continuation of the series of the Red Letters. I did not have the, the pretty little graphic or whatever. Um, or I didn't put it up. That wasn't unintentional, but it was. <laughs> anyway, I just didn't put it up. Um, but anyway, the Red Letters... Someone came up to me and asked me the other day, is, there, is it okay that my Bible doesn't have the red letters in it and the other ones and some other ones do? And I said, well, yeah, that's fine. That's just publisher stuff. Some of them have them printed in red and others don't. There's nothing wrong with it either way. Um, but the red letters are significant, and uh, a publisher down the road, I don't know the story, but a publisher down the road decided, you know, let's put the words of Jesus in red so they're easy to point out. There was another individual in our history, in the history of our country, that thought that the words of Jesus were important, and his name was Thomas Jefferson. I don't know that many of you know this, but you know the controversial quote-unquote Jefferson Bible that they talk about in history? The Thomas Jefferson Bible was literally just the letters in red. He wrote down the sayings of Jesus. He didn't change anything. He didn't edit anything. He just wrote down what Jesus said and left out everything else. <laughs> because, because of why? He thought G what Jesus said was important. And guess what? Every freshman, congressman, and senator, when they came into office to serve, until the 19-teens, got a copy of Jesus' words. It was, that was copied by Jefferson. It wasn't until Woodrow Wilson, a progressive, said that that was not important anymore in separation of church and state, right? What's funny to me is that the very person that said the separation of church and state was the very person that wrote Jesus' words. Because there's a misinterpretation in his letter, talking about separation of church and state. He wanted to protect the church from the state, not the other way around. Because Jefferson was definitely a libertarian in that way. <laughs> definitely. Needless to say, Jesus' words are important. And Jesus' words mostly, with the exception of Acts, are found in the Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are considered synoptic Gospels. Um... They were sourced off of each other. I won't go into all of the too much detail on that. I went and dwelled on it a little bit last night, but they were sourced off of each other, whereas John was kind of, he just, he just wrote it himself. <laughs> he didn't source them. And there was some talk. Uh, I don't know if many of you know this, but Acts is actually book two of Luke. It was a series that Luke had written. So it was actually part one and part two. And when they came together and they're, they were at, there's this big council, they're putting together the canon and which scriptures they wanted to actually have in the canon. When they were doing that, 
there was actually quite a lot of debate where to put John because John was not a synoptic, so they wanted, but they wanted the synoptics together, but they wanted the Gospels together, and they wanted Luke and Acts together because they are book one and book two. See a problem here? And they wanted Matthew first because of the genealogy of Jesus, which totally makes sense. <laughs> So there was, there was a little bit of a debate, and that's why, Lu, or that's why John is just smack in the middle of between uh, Luke and Acts, um, because that's, that's finally what they decided to do. But that's neither here nor there, is it? That's not really relevant. So let's get into the, let's get into the word. So what does it take? to be a disciple. And what does Jesus say about this? Uh, yeah, it's not clicking for me. Jesus has, there's several stories here. We're not going to go through all those passages. I usually I pick one per topic. Usually pick one per topic. And I didn't do the nice little swish things. It didn't transfer correctly when I moved the file. So, I apologize ahead of time for that. Okay, so what does Jesus say it means to be a disciple? Well, first of all, we have to be called to be a disciple, do we not? When Jesus called the disciples, what did he tell them? He's like, you're going to be fishers of men, right? Fishers of people, depending on what translation you re read. So, and then the Beatitudes is the attitudes that we're supposed to have as disciples, right? As followers of Christ, definitely. We'll touch on those, but Andy did a sermon a long time ago about that, so look that up on YouTube for more details. Gosh, that was forever ago, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the good sermon series, though. And that's in a couple of different places. And then the light, being the light of the world, that's what we're called to do as being disciples. So what's it take to be called to be a disciple? Well, Jesus has to call you, right? Yeah? Matthew 4, 18 20 through 20. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon and called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting the net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send, I will send you out to fish for people. And once and at once, they left their nets and followed him. I want to focus a little bit on what they left. Yes, they left their physical nets, but they left a whole lot more than that. They left their families. They left well, their job, they left everything, absolutely everything to behind to follow Jesus. They didn't know this guy from anybody, but the Spirit talked to them, didn't he? He said, you need to go, and what did they do? They just dropped everything and they went. That can relate to us today. It can. We don't necessarily always have to leave our jobs, but sometimes we do. When Jesus calls us to salvation, we have to drop what we're currently doing and decide that we're going to live after him, to follow him, to become disciples, learn what it takes to start that journey of discipleship, or what we like to call in the church sanctification. That's what that is. It's the journey, the walk with Christ, the walk to being a true disciple of Jesus. So it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight, but you have to make the decision to drop what you're doing and follow him, right? Drop the sin, and let's go do this thing. So that's what it takes. God calls us, the Holy Spirit calls us to drop what we're doing and follow him, well, no matter what that may be. It looks different for everybody. And there's people in Scripture that didn't do that. Remember those people? And what did Jesus do? He just said, okay, have a good day. It's your choice. And he lets us do that too. He lets us walk away. 
And unfortunately, a lot of people do. <laughs> it is definitely a choice that we have. He doesn't push it on us. He wants, it, he wants us to come to him in love. The Beatitudes. These are the attitudes that a disciple is to have. And like I said, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on them, but we'll, we'll go through them. They're poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek, the hungry, the merciful, the pure in heart, peacemakers, the reveled and persecuted. All of us have been persecuted to some degree. If you call yourself a person of faith, all of us have been persecuted in one way or another. But these are the attitudes that we are to have. And that is all the time I'm going to spend on that because, like I said, I'm not going to dwell on that too long. What also makes a disciple is being the light of the world, the salt of the earth, right? We give the world its flavor, <laughs> as it says here. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by, underfoot. You are the light of the world, a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. I hate to tell you this, but I know a lot of Christians, and sometimes even including myself, that do exactly that. And he's saying, disciples don't do that. Disciples don't hide who they really are. And if we are to be the light of the world, we should not hide who we are. And I think, I think generally, culturally, Christians have hidden too long as a whole, as a body. We've hidden ourselves under a bowl so we don't get criticized, and we end up getting criticized in any way. <laughs> so why, don't, why aren't we standing up for what Christ says, what Jesus says? Anyway, continuing on. Instead, they put it on a light stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others that they... Uh, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So all of this, disciples, they are the light of the world. There's not a whole lot else to say about that. We are to be the light. And a lot of times we aren't. And we have allowed our culture to go by the wayside. Now, what is a true disciple? When I think of disciple, I don't know about you, but I think, and then these are obviously what, you know, what my opinions are, but when I think of disciple, I do think of when Jesus called Peter out and said, come out. Come out of the boat and walk with me. Now, if you can imagine, let's, let's read a little bit of this. And uh, I didn't put this on the screen, and that was kind of intentional. No, one, it's a little longer, but it's uh, kind of intentional for you to actually read your Bible for a minute. If you look, open to Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Something that's kind of interesting to me, you can see the Matthew, Matthew's version, you can see Mark's version there, and you can see John's. Um, Matthew's is a good 11 verses. Mark's is a little less than that, like, what, eight, seven, eight? And John's is like four. <laughs> it's funny to see that how what different different authors think is important. Uh, John, it's not that this moment wasn't important, but 
at the same well luke didn't even he didn't even talk about it so you can see what that is <laughs> um but it's funny to read them one right after the other. Matthew is obviously the account we're going to look at because it actually explains what happened. Um, but it's interesting to see the different points of view, what they emphasize and what they don't, and it has to do with the audience that each of the books was written to. Um, so, But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Let's dig into it. I just wanted to give you a little time to look it up. Matthew 14, 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples go out into the boat and they were dismissed from while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside to pray by himself. When the evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already considerable distance from land, buffeted by waves and because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Then the disciples saw him walking on the lake and were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Now, when disciple, or, you know, when I, when we just read it for face value, you're like, man, these disciples are crazy. I mean, it's obviously Jesus, but if you put yourself in that scenario, you're out on a boat, and through the fog, you know your way out in the water, and through the fog, you see this figure, like, walking on top of the water, and yeah, I think most people would think it was a ghost, right? <laughs> it's not anything, because it, it's, not, it's not scientifically possible to walk on top of water. That's just something that we know is not the case. And they were more superstitious then than what we are now <laughs> because we have a lot more knowledge about how science works now than, than what they did then. But not, needless to say, I always try to put myself, when I hear a story, I always try to put myself in the shoes and try to imagine it myself because what kind of, what kind of emotions do you think they were feeling? when they saw a figure walking on top of the water. They'd be afraid, for one. Like, what is this? Confused? Right? Definitely. Fear, confusion, faithlessness, doubt. They would be doubting, you know, that's part of confusion. And then... Uh, when they realized it was Christ, look, look and see what happens when they realize it was Christ. They were terrified and thought it was a ghost. Verse 27, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come onto the water. And Jesus said, come. Peter got out of the boat came down towards Jesus, and then he saw the wind and became afraid. So here it is, Peter, a normal human being, not, not fully God human being, but a normal human being like me and you is walking on water, defying science itself. And then what happens? His fear, his concern takes hold, and he takes his eye off Christ. This is not this is not an abnormal thing. When we're disciples, we can do incredible things. But it's not on our own power. And as soon as we take our eye off Christ, we begin to sink. The very minute we take our eye off of Christ, just like in this, we begin to sink. But then again, if we look if we continue to look at this story. Immediately, Jesus reached down his hand and caught him. You have little faith. I can just see it. I can just see how he said it. Eh, you have little faith. Come on, get up here. Why do you doubt? And they climbed back into the boat, and the wind died down, and they, those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. 
See, it's funny. When we turn around, when we lose it for a second, we begin to sink. But then if we go, oh, God, I'm sorry, he's going to reach down and pull us up and say, what were you thinking? He says that to me a lot. (laughs) What were you thinking? Jeez. But it happens. It all happens. That, that's, that's, that story is because God calls us to do amazing things. Just taking, if you look at just salvation itself, taking someone that is self-centered, everything is about them, and all of a sudden a total mind flip when it happens, and now everything is about the kingdom of God. How do you do that? That shouldn't be possible, but it is through Christ. When we let the impossible, when we let that slide by the things that we do, just not focusing on God when, for, the, for those moments, we begin to sink. And he is happy to grab us when we say, okay, God, I messed up. He's happy to grab us and pull us back up and say that we're silly and go on with our lives. Jesus calls uh, his disciples his friends. If we look at John 15, 17 through 12 through 17, I command this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You guys all know this passage, but we're going to read it anyway. You are my friends, if you do what I command. You notice there's a, there's a tag there, if you do what I command. If we don't, we aren't. <laughs> I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything I learn from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so what, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? But it's not. If we, dig, if we dig into the root of what Jesus tells us when he was walking, when he was walking on this earth, and he was tell, teaching the disciples, they looked like fools, and he, well, he looked like Jesus. We're the disciples, guys. We do foolish things all the time. So it's funny. It, it's funny to me how we can laugh and joke about you know, the disciples being idiots or whatever, but that's us. We're idiots. (laughs) We do stupid things. But Jesus loves us anyway. You know, after Jesus was gone from the physical world, I mean, physically, he was not there anymore with the disciples. This is why Luke, part two, it, I mean, if you read Luke and then Acts, if you read one and then start the other one the same day, it flows almost like it's one book. But if you, if you read that, the continuation of the story, all of a sudden in Acts, after Jesus goes up into heaven, in Acts, all of a sudden the disciples are amazing people. No, they were still the same idiots that followed Jesus. They're still the same people. They still messed up. They were the same guys. But you know what the difference was? The difference was they realized this. You can do great things. I have taught you everything that you need to know. Now go and love each other, and the Spirit will do the rest. (laughs) 
rewards for the discipleship. Here's a bunch of them. Uh, they talk about similar things. Uh, generally speaking, here's, here's three of them that I wrote out for you. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me, sorry, rejects me, rejects him who sent me. So basically what Jesus is saying, if you reject him, you're rejecting God and himself. And they all say virtually the same thing, um, except Matthew 7, 7. It says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. I think that's really what the true reward of being a disciple is. Is that now all of a sudden you have the most loving and powerful father the richest father that you could possibly have on your side. And he wants what's best for you through all of the easy times, all of the hard times, all of the time. But we have to ask him. And that's part of what living discipleship life is. It's keeping focused on Christ and asking for help when we need it. That does not necessarily mean physical realm, by the way. Okay, so we're going to, what's the fate of being a disciple? I hate to tell you this, but it's not always fun. <laughs> Actually, most of the disciples were killed for their faith. They were persecuted there was a lot of disciples that weren't in the Bible that were martyred for their faith. You know, back in the, you know, in Roman times, before Christianity became uh, the official religion of the empire, which we'll talk about that later, before that happened, Christians were getting tied to posts and eaten by lions. Why? Because they were Christians and the other and other people were finding entertainment in that. This kind of stuff happened. So the cost of discipleship is literally your life. <laughs> That's the cost. It's literally your life. Whether it be your physical body or just your soul, it's literally your life. But at the same time, God takes that life and makes something great, doesn't he? This is what Jesus says we will experience as the fate, as our fate. This is Luke 21, 12 through 19. But before all of this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on my account, the account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will be, how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you the words and the wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed by parents, brothers, sisters, and sisters, relatives, and friends. They will put some of you to death. Everyone will, f everyone will hate you because of me. But not a hair on your head will perish. Stand firm, and you will win life. So when you, guys, when you guys found Christ originally, and I know there are stories out here in this church where verse 16 happened to you, you will be betrayed by your parents, brothers, and sisters. I hear stories all the time. You 
your relatives and friends, they won't know what happened to you. <laughs> and they will probably betray you or abandon you, tell you that they don't want to have spend any time. Being a new Christian's tough, guys. It really is. And making those choices, it's tough. There will be people that want nothing to do with you, and that's that's okay. And as difficult as it is when the time is happening, you know that there's a greater, there's something greater on the other side of it. You know, it's it's funny too. I hear stories like that where the let's say the family rejects you because you accepted Christ. My great grandmother was that way. And you know what's funny? My great grandmother led every single one of them to Christ. So the spirit can flip it. That's why in 19 it says, stand firm, you will win. (laughs) Because you already have. Because you have have the father, the most powerful father in the world behind you. So what's the ultimate reward? When Jesus was dying on the cross, he said this, to the felon dying next to him. He said, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That is the ultimate reward. And I tell you, and I tell you this, yes, you will be in paradise, living a, dis- living a life of discipleship. You will be in paradise with him in heaven. But you can bring... God can use you to bring that paradise here, too. That joy can be here when you follow him. And it is here when you follow him. Yes, we will make mistakes. Yes, we will fall on our face. Yes, we will sink. But he's always there to grab us. And let me tell you, as you continue down the road of discipleship, it surprisingly gets harder, but it gets easier. And yes, I know I just contradicted myself. But it's the truth. Sometimes, sometimes the truth of God don't make a whole lot of sense to our fecal or our uh, frail minds. So I leave you with that. If you haven't made the choice to become a disciple, it is the hardest journey you will ever start, but it is definitely the most rewarding journey you will ever start. So I encourage you to do that. If you haven't already, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your words. Now, there's so much to them that if we just skim over them, sometimes we catch little glimpses, but if we really dig into them and compare them to our own lives, how they're still relevant and there's still truth in them. We ask that you be with us, God, as we continue to, as some of us continue to walk in your light, to walk with you maybe even on the water doing the impossible. If we haven't come to that realization yet, please help us send your spirit down and convict us, Lord, because it's time. It's already past time. We thank you, God, for all you do. In your name we pray. Amen.